Okay, so the last uh, lecture for the day, and, and this um, is the last one because it's important. So I've been really building up to this one. All right, covalent bonding. Now, a metal and a nonmetal have a tendency to exchange electrons and make ionic bonds, a metal and a nonmetal. So you know where to find the metals, right? <clears throat> and you know where to find the nonmetals. So just as a, as a uh, quick benefit, I'm going to come back over to the periodic table. The metals, the nonmetals are sort of over here, right? These are the nonmetals, and everything else is a metal. Everything else is a metal. Those are all metals, 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 okay? So everything on the other side of that diagonal line is a nonmetal. <clears throat> all right, let me get rid of those notes there. Go back over here. So a metal and a nonmetal tend to exchange electrons with each other and form ionic bonds. Nonmetals tend to share electrons with each other, forming covalent bonds. They share electrons with each other and form covalent bonds. So here's a nonmetal, and here's a nonmetal, right? And those form bonds, definitely are bonds, right? It's very important, very important in nature. So covalent bonds are formed between atoms that have similar abilities to attract electrons. There's a big word we're coming, gonna use this a lot to attract electrons. Okay, so for example, consider the H2 molecule. The electronic configuration for H2 is 1s1. I'm sorry, just for, for hydrogen is 1s1, 1s1. And here's another 1s1 over here. There's only one valence electron here and one valence electron here. We might draw this hydrogen atom like this and this hydrogen atom like this and we go, you know what? These guys, they'll share. And they do, they do share. And they go from an atomic orbital, an atomic orbital here, and they make, the two together, make a molecular orbital, okay? And they go into a molecular orbital, which is lower in, in energy, which we'll get more into. Each hydrogen now has a first valence shell filled with two electrons, just like the noble gas helium, and that's why it's, that's one of the reasons why it's good, okay? So HF is something similar. The electronic configuration for hydrogen is 1s1. For fluorine, it's 1s2. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, um, right? And so you might think, uh, let's go with a different color. Hydrogen might look like this. Fluorine, now we're only gonna draw do you remember only the valence electrons are involved in the formation of the covalent bond? So I might go one, two, and there's the valence electrons right there, seven, right? Right, so these guys go together and they share to make a bond. So we would draw, we would say uh, that would be a decent representation of HF, right? After forming a covalent bond, both hydrogen and fluorine are each isoelectronic with a noble gas. Hydrogen feels like helium because it's got two electrons in its outer shell. Fluorine feels like neon because it has eight electrons in its outer shell, right? So this is really nice and it works beautifully. Now here's another representation of this. If you have two hydrogen atoms, let's take a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here, and they're sufficiently far away. So this is the internuclear distance. This is, if they're sufficiently far away, then their energy is not uh, helped at all by the fact that these electrons are close, okay? But as they come closer, there's some overlap here, and these orbitals begin to say, you know what, this feels kind of more convenient. It feels like I have my outer shell filled. And so there's a decrease in energy. Do you see that? It comes down. And as they get even closer, look at, there's an ideal bond length right there. My two hydrogens right here. And the ideal bond length is when they're just right. And they go, you know what? This is the perfect length. And now this hot, both hydrogens feel like they've got two electrons in their outer shell. Okay? So this is a common graph that's used to show uh, ideal bond lengths, right? You can imagine if I stretch these out a little bit, it's going to be like, oh, it's not so comfortable. Stretch it out even more, ooh, not so comfortable. Stretch it out even more, and we go, I'm just about. And by the time you get here, you go, you know what? We might as well not even be bonded. Right? That's what that's about. 
Okay, so to break chemical bonds, energy must be added, which is an endothermic process, which is what I was indicating right here. In order to break this, I'm going to add some energy and bring the energy up a little bit, add a little more, add a little more, add a little more, and boom, right? Okay, so to break chemical bonds, energy must be added, which is an endothermic process. The formation of chemical bonds releases energy, right, which is exothermic. The bond makes each atom more stable and therefore it's lower in energy, and that's what happens, okay? All covalent bonds involve the sharing of electrons, but the electrons, this is important now, the electrons are not always shared equally. Sometimes one atom gets more of it than the other. So in our HF instance, this fluorine actually hogs the electrons a little bit more than the hydrogen, okay? And so if, if, they, if they hold them just the same, it's considered a pure covalent bond. It's nonpolar. If it's equal sharing of electrons, let me go back to red, I like red better. Equal sharing of electrons is purely, no, uh, purely covalent. Now, if it's unequal, which I kind of indicated up here, where fluorine's getting more than its fair share, we might call it a polar covalent bond. And this derives from a feature that we're going to call electronegativity. If the electronegativity of fluorine is greater, it's going to pull the electrons this way, okay? I haven't defined electronegativity yet, but I'm about to. If electronegativity is greater, it's going to pull the bonding electrons that way, all right? And it's going to make it a polar bond, okay? So electronegativity is defined as a measure of the tendency to attract bonding electrons to itself. It's a measure of the tendency of an atom to, to attract the bonding electrons to itself. Linus Pauling, uh, who was at, um, I think he was at Berkeley, UC, UC Berkeley, actually not that long ago. I think he died pretty recently. He came up with a scale that was called uh, electronegativity scale. All right. <clears throat> the electronegativity trend goes like this. If this is a periodic table, it increases as we go up and it increases as we go over. And sometimes people put those two together and say, just basically, that would be a decent way to say it. It goes, as it goes up and to the right, it increases. Electronegativity increases as you go up and to the right. All right, so that's what I just said, up and to the right. It says decreasing that way. Really probably should put increasing this way. Okay, but we exclude the noble gases. Why? Why are the noble gases not on here? because there are no bonding electrons in noble gases, okay? So, pure covalent bonds form when atoms have the exact same or very similar electronegativities, right? This occurs in all bonds where the atoms are the same. CH is considered a pure covalent bond, even though they're not exactly the same. The electronegativities are pretty close. On most scales, it's 2.5 and 2.2. Those electronegativities are pretty close, and so that's considered a pure covalent bond. All right. Polar covalent bonds come when there's unequal sharing of the electrons, and it forms when they have significantly different electronegativity values. Most covalent bonds uh, involving different atoms um, um, per our polar, that's a little bit of a strong statement. I wouldn't say most. I'd say a lot of covalent bonds involving different atoms are polar covalent. The polarity of a bond increases with the increasing electronegativity difference. The polar bond is considered a dipole, and we're going to indicate that with a partial charge, partial positive and partial negative. And I'll show you. Here's an example. Let me go back to red here. We have oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen. This is a very electronegative element right here. And so hydrogen is, uh, hydrogen is not. The electronegativity of hydrogen is about 2.2. Oxygen is about 3.5. That's a you wouldn't know this because you haven't seen many of these, but that's a big difference. Okay, we'll we'll say more about this. Now, what we're going to do to indicate this is polar is we're going to draw an arrow to the more electronegative element and put a plus sign at the tail by the less electronegative element. So there's a, a polar bond there, a polar bond here. Okay, and we're going to put a partial positive here. It's not really a full positive. These electrons are not stolen. Right, but there's they're they're not hydrogen's not getting its fair share, so we're gonna say it's got a partial positive charge. This is a partial negative charge. This is a partial positive charge because again, this is a hydrogen, right? 
Now, sometimes people will combine these two, uh, these two um, polar bonds, those two vectors, and they'll say, you know what, let's, let's add these two vectors together and say that there's a net polarity that goes in that direction. Can you see why if you add these two blue vectors together, you're going to get this green vector? Okay, so electronegativity, now, it's, this is a, a general rule of thumb. The absolute value of the difference provides a rough measure of the bond type. Purely covalent is going to be if it's less than 0 0.4. Sometimes people put less than 0 0.5. Okay? Polar covalent, it's going to be if it's less than 0, between 0 0.4 or 0 0.5. And 1.8, sometimes people say 1.7. Anything greater than 1.8, electronegativity difference of greater than 1.8 is going to make uh, ions. At some point, the electronegativity difference is so much that the more electronegative element just steals the electrons, and it becomes an ion. Okay? Final graphic then for the day. Electronegativity differences between atoms. If it's zero, it's polar covalent. If it's intermediate, it's... I'm sorry, if it's zero, it's purely covalent. We just call it covalent. If it's intermediate, we call it polar covalent. If it's large, we call it ionic. All right, and ionic character increases as we go that way, of course. All right. All right, that was a lot of work for the day. Good work, folks. Go practice uh, these concepts with uh, homework problems. Good luck.